We'll continue our discussion on duality. It's already 1.50, right? Yeah, it's 1.52. I lost two minutes. Uh, duality, okay? So, uh, what did we discuss last time? We said that, well, we want to take a look at the geometric picture of the class of optimization problems that we are solving. So, we considered this problem minimize fx such that g of x is less than equal to 0 and x is in some set capital X. And we said that, you know, the right, one of the ways of looking at this problem is in this space, gx, which is in r raised to r and f of x which is in r. So, y axis is my uh, evaluation of function and this axis is my r raised to r in which this value g of x sits. And the constraint is g x is less than equal to 0. So, we are looking at this side of the space. We are not looking at that side of the space. And then of course, we define this set s this is set S, which is the set of all gx, comma, f of x for x in capital X. Now, you can imagine that if, if x is, if capital X is a continuous set, it is a some subset of Rn, then S is going to perhaps look like a, look like a solid object, but if x was a discrete set, If x was a discrete set, if capital X is discrete, like x equals to 0, 1 raised to n, if that is the case, then it actually is, s is going to look just like points. Okay, this will be my set s, just a bunch of points if x was a discrete set. And you remember if we if you recall, one of the problem we were trying to solve in the previous class, the example was, I want to infimize e raised to x such that x is less than equal to 0. What does that look like? So, this is my g of x equals x. This is my e raised to x or f of x equals e raised to x. So, it actually looks something like this. Right? This is my e raised to x graph. This is what it looks like. Uh, the f x g x graph. So, it does not look like a solid solid ball or solid figure of this type. It is just a, just a curve uh, or a, uh, yeah, it is just a curve in, uh, in R 2. So, so, when I draw this figure s in this form, do not assume that S is actually going to look something like this. It might look like this or it might look like this. Okay. Okay. So, the scheduling problem that we talked about, the traveling salesman problem, this is what it, what it looks like. In fact, in that case, X was uh, 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 the space 0, 1, 0, 1 raised to n cross n. So, it looks like a matrix of just zeros and 1s. Okay? All right. Uh, any question about that? About the figure? Okay. And then we, again going back to this particular figure, if I draw a line, a hyperplane, with the normal as mu comma 1, if it passes through g of x, let us say g of x 1 and f of x 1, then this intercept is equal to L of x 1 comma mu. And if I draw a line 
that is parallel to this line, but it just touches this set S exactly at one point, or it supports S. It supports S. Uh, what what is what does it mean that it supports S? Well, S lies completely in the positive half space of this particular line. This also has a normal mu comma one, and this intercept. Anyone remembers what this intercept is? Sorry, inf of the Lagrangian x in capital X. Okay, so if you look at this figure, this is my inf of L x comma mu x in capital X. It's so the entire set S. Remember, what are these points? These are the points that constitute the set S, and all these points are in the positive half space of this particular. Hyperplane with the normal mu comma one, and in this case, remember that this line asymptotically converges to zero, right? As x goes to minus infinity, so in fact, you know this this x-axis, which is basically g-x axis, that itself is mu comma one. A mu star which is equal to zero, comma one. That's the normal to this particular line, right? Remember, mu star equal to zero is the geometric multiplier for this particular problem. Okay. And what is the y-intercept here? The y-intercept is actually zero, right? Because it's just the x-axis, so the y-intercept is equal to zero. Okay. So this is known as this. These two. Uh, the so the result that the hyper the y-intercept of hyperplane is going to be L of the Lagrangian evaluated at x one comma mu. Uh, this is known as visualization lemma. And even though I can actually prove the visualization lemma uh, mathematically, I'm actually just going to ask you to visualize the lemma, okay? As the name suggests. So I'm not going to give you a mathematical proof, but what this lemma says, you, you draw a hyperplane through the set S its y intercept is going to be l of x comma mu and if you if you translate this uh, this line this hyperplane such that the entire set s is in the positive half space and it touches s it, it doesn't have to touch s but there shouldn't be any gap between the hyperplane and the set s then the y intercept is going to be inf over all x in x l of x comma mu okay so this line, which doesn't touch the set S at all, uh, it, even though it has a y-intercept, it has no meaning. Okay, it's not. It has no meaning. Okay, so this point is inf over x in x, l of x mu, but this point has no such uh, significance. Okay, so that's part one of visualization lemma, part two of visualization lemma, and then there is part three which says that so let me write the part 3 one mu star is geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than or equal to 0 and vertical intercept is
hyperplane. Now I want to say vertical intercept of the hyperplane with S, S in positive half space, with positive half space is F star. But you know this is this is not the most rigorous way of writing it because I also want the hyperplane to actually touch the set S. Okay, so any hyperplane that I'm going to talk about from now onwards is either going through the set or it's going to touch the set at some point. Okay, so in this case it's touching it at this point. If it's not touching, if there is a gap between the set S and the hyperplane, then that hyperplane is of no use to us. Okay, so we won't even think about it. Now, concentrate on this particular hyperplane. It's not actually touching the set S, right? But asymptotically, this 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 curve is going to actually meet the line when x equals minus infinity, right? So, so keep that in mind uh, that it may not necessarily touch the set S at any point but maybe it's going to touch it at infinity okay so that's something you should keep in the in the back of your mind that could also happen okay any question about that so that's geometric multiplier if i want to draw geometric multiplier here let me draw geometric multiplier here well let me just write it as mu comma 1 that's the normal to this particular line but then i can draw another line okay so the entire set s is in the positive half space and if you look at the normal mu star comma 1 the normal this mu star is going to be the geometric multiplier Okay, so the entire set S is in the positive half space. This uh, this line actually touches the set in this case, and its intercept. This intercept is actually f star. Okay, the optimal value of the minimization problem. That's f star. Sorry. Uh, you see, uh, the x intercept, the x intercept, so, sorry, the fx intercept, the y intercept of this particular line is not the, it's not the optimal value of f star, okay? It's just inf of, inf of lx comma mu. Remember that the way geometric multipliers are defined, what's the definition? of geometric multiplier so the definition is mu star greater than or equal to 0 and f star equals to n over x in x l of x comma mu right so this has to be equal to f star right and in this case it's not f star f star is right here so this is n of l x comma mu yeah. How do you know for, for F star, like how do you, like for discrete space, how do you prove that it's the optimal solution? Oh, um, we'll talk about the discrete space later on, okay? So discrete space is quite, uh, well, we'll talk about it later on, okay? Discrete space is, 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 so, is somewhat of a problem because, uh, yeah we'll we'll get to it at some point of time i'm trying to think how to talk about it without actually introducing the concept and i'm not able to think about it so yeah for the continuum space the angle of that line is decided by the tangency to the set right right but for the discrete space how is this angle being decided so that the all the points lie on the on one side, side yes and Yes, and the intercept is minimum. 
uh, so yeah so let's let's look at an example where mu star doesn't exist okay we saw that in the previous class but let me let me introduce it again i mean let me show you when that happens so this is my set s okay and if you want okay so this is my f star okay this is for gx less than equal to 0 so which is this side this is my this is my uh, f star point, and so the y intercept is going to be f star here okay that's the lowest point for gx less than equal to 0 for this set s now, if I want to draw a line, a hyperplane, that has the intercept f star and keeps s in the positive half space, I cannot draw any hyperplane of that sort. Okay, so one hyperplane could be like this, but it's cutting through s. So you have to draw a hyperplane that looks something like this. Okay, but then its y-intercept is not f star so there is no lagrange there is no geometric multiplier my question was like in these cases you are deciding the angle of the line by the tangency at the bottom most point of the set yeah so the entire set has to be in one side so in this case it has to be tangent here and here So, so you, I can draw multiple lines, right? But in, in this, when you look at this line, it is tangent at two points, right? With mu star greater than or equal to zero, right? I can also do, let's say this point was somewhere here, okay? Then mu star will actually be zero because if I draw a line like this, okay, then also it's in the positive half space, but this line will have mu star less than zero which by definition is excluded because geometric multiplier has to have mu star strictly, well, not strictly positive, but greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so you can, you can draw a line, you can draw a line, you can draw a line like this, it's fine. You can draw a line like this, that's also fine. You can draw a line like this, that's fine. You can draw a horizontal line, that's completely fine because at horizontal, your mu star is equal to zero and then comma one. But this line, you can't draw it, okay? Because then mu star is negative. Uh, not mu star, but mu is negative. So you are trying to draw a line that has a negative slope because remember mu star is minus m, right? At least in two dimensions, okay? So this idea is true in higher dimension as well. So you want your mu star, you want the slope to be negative so, so that mu star can be positive. Okay, so this is, this is, this is uh, not, not possible. Okay, so either a horizontal line or a line with some sort of slope, negative slope. As long as they are? Negative, well, yeah, negative or zero slope, yes. They are acceptable. They are acceptable. Okay. Well, in this case, they did not intercept at the minimum point. In this case, they did. In this case, they do. Okay. So in this case, what is that? So this is my F star. And my hyperplane is going to look like this. Okay. With mu star equals to zero. Okay, and that's going to intercept the y-axis at f star. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that's the geometric picture you have to keep in mind.
ओके then there is this theorem which says that mu star is geometric multiplier then x star is optimal if and only if x star is feasible and uh x star is an in inf not in but argument x in capital x l of x comma mu star and mu star j g j x star is equal to 0 for all j okay and i don't want you to confuse this with the with the complementary slackness condition we studied for kkd condition okay these are completely different things okay so one side is easy to prove which is if x star is feasible and x star is an argument and this holds then x star is optimal that part is is simple so i'll prove the other way which requires some amount of work okay so let me prove this part so i'm assuming that assume x star is optimal so since it is optimal then it means that x star is feasible which means that gj of x star is less than equal to 0 okay and we know that mu star is geometric multiplier so this thing would imply that f star equals to n of x in x l of x mu star okay so what i have is f star equals f of x star which is greater than equal to f of x star plus summation mu j star g j x star j equals 1 to r why is that so mu j star is non negative so this is greater than equal to 0 this is less than equal to 0 so this whole term is less than equal to 0 and since i am summing up negative or zero elements it's going to be something less than equal to zero and i'm subtracting something from f of x star so that will be less than f of x star itself okay so this is what i have used here what is this equal to what is this equal to this term anyone remembers what is this equal to l l of x star comma mu star right that's how we define the lagrangian so that's equal to l of x star comma mu star which is greater than equals to in over x in x l of x comma mu star okay so i have two inequalities here 
And I know that f star is equal to inf of L of x mu star, which means these inequalities were actually equality, right? Okay. So what did we prove? We proved that well, if x star is optimal, if x star is optimal, then x star is feasible by definition of optimality. And then we proved that f of x star is actually equal to minimum of the Lagrangian evaluated at mu star. Okay? So which means that x star is in the argument of the Lagrangian. We still haven't proved this part. Okay, we still need to prove this part. How should we go about proving it? Okay, so this implies that f of x star is equal to n of x in x, l of x comma mu star. Okay, so that implies this equality implies this result. But how do I prove this part? Any thoughts? Why should mu j star g j x star be equal to 0? Yeah. Okay. So let me replace it by equality. Okay. So I'm still not getting I'm still not getting this equal to 0. Why would this be equal to 0? Yeah, so so what we get is since this is equal to this, so this summation is equal to zero, but this is summation of negative non non positive numbers, right? So which means that each of those numbers have to be zero. Yeah. So that explains this equality. So what she's saying is summation of mu j star g j x star is equal to zero j equals 1 to r. So these numbers, each of these numbers can be either negative or 0, right? But they sum to 0, which means each of them individually have to be equal to 0. Otherwise, if one of them is negative, there is no positive number to counterbalance that negative number in order to make it equal to 0, right? In order to make the sum equal to 0. So each of them individually has to be equal to 0. So that gives me this part of the result. So this is proved, this is proved, and this is proved. Any question about this result? Okay, so now think about it this way. Somebody magically gave you what the geometric... So you have to solve a problem. You have to solve a problem. Somebody magically gave you the geometric multiplier. So somebody said that, you know what? Here is the mu star, and I know for sure that that mu star is a geometric multiplier to this particular problem, okay? Then what do you do? How do you solve the problem? How do you solve that problem? Well, you say that, you know what, since that is a geometric multiplier, I can find the optimal solution by just minimizing the Lagrangian evaluated at geometric multiplier. And how do you minimize the Lagrangian? Well, you use gradient descent or Newton's method or whatever. Okay, to find the arg min of L of x comma mu star, you get x star, and by this theorem, you know that x star is the optimal to this particular problem. Okay? The only problem is, who is that someone who will actually tell you what mu star is? Okay, that's the only problem. Okay, so that's a problem. How do I find mu star? Okay, so the goal is to find mu star.
Hmm. So here is a, a problem that I want you guys to think about. I define a function q of mu as inf of the Lagrangian x comma mu where x is in capital X. Okay, so q is a function from R R to R. And let me define D as actually I should make it R union plus infinity and minus infinity. And I define D as mu in R R such that Q mu is greater than minus infinity. Okay, so let me go back to the picture. I have this set, okay, and I define for every mu, so this is my mu comma 1 or mu 1 comma 1 and this is my q mu 1 and then I define it's going to get cluttered. Okay, let me try and draw a better figure so it doesn't clutter everything. How do I draw a figure? Okay. This is my set S. This is my R R and this is my R. So this is my mu 1 comma 1 and this is my Q of mu 1. This is the normal is mu 2 comma 1 and this is my Q of mu 2 and this is my mu 3 comma 1 and this y intercept is Q of mu 3. Okay, so I define this function, so for this, for every mu which is greater than or equal to 0, I define this function which is the y intercept of this line, these hyperplanes. Okay, so that gives me q of mu and I define the set D such that q of mu is greater than minus infinity. So q of mu cannot be equal to minus infinity in this set D. What do you see happens here? Okay, as I change the value of mu, my value of q goes higher and higher until mu 3, until the value of mu becomes equal to 0, right? After which you can't, you can't change the slope of the hyperplane because it becomes negative, right? Mu, mu will become negative, so you can't change the slope. So what you want to solve is supremum of q mu such that mu is in d. Okay, and since you have removed this minus infinity part, so you are only concentrating on values of q that are either positive or maybe plus infinity. Okay, so you want to solve this problem. It turns out, and we will see it in a bit, that mu star is actually the arg max of Q of mu, assuming that it exists. Okay, so if this, if there is an arg max, and assuming some conditions are uh, are true, 
some things, uh, some things are true, which we will talk about it in a bit. Mu star will actually become the arg max of this particular, this particular function. Okay. And so this is known as the dual problem. Dual problem. The problem we started with that was minimization of fx as that g of x is less than or equal to zero. That is said to be the primal problem. Okay, primal is the problem that you want to solve. Dual is a problem. Dual problem is a problem that you construct from the primal problem. Okay, by constructing the Lagrangian, taking the infimum and then coming up with a function. So let's look at what this function looks like in the case of linear programming problem. Let's try and look at the simplest linear program and see what we get. So my primal problem is I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX is less than or equal to B. So what is my Lagrangian? That is C transpose X plus mu transpose AX minus B, right? C transpose let me write it as X transpose C plus A transpose mu minus B transpose mu. Okay, and by the way, X capital X is R N. Yeah. So now I want to minimize L of X comma mu over the entire R N. So my Q of mu is equal to in of L X comma mu X is in R N. Okay. Sounds like an easy problem. What would this be equal to? So let's say, uh, do I need to make an assumption that x is greater than or equal to 0? I don't want to make that assumption. Okay, let's not make that assumption. So I'll have two, two, two possibilities. The first possibility is C plus C plus A transpose mu equal to zero and C plus A transpose mu not equal to zero. So what happens when C plus A transpose mu is equal to zero? What's the infimum? Any thoughts? Sorry? Minus B transpose mu. What happens when C plus A transpose mu is not equal to zero? Negative infinity? Right? Why should this be negative infinity? If this is not equal to zero, I can take one of these values in X to be positive infinity or negative infinity and drive the infimum all the way to negative infinity. Okay, That's why I'll have negative infinity if this term was non-zero. Okay. So, so my Q of mu is equal to minus B transpose mu and my D is the set of mu in 
R R such that C plus A transpose mu is equal to 0. So what is my dual problem? The dual problem is to maximize minus B transpose mu such that C plus A transpose mu is equal to 0 and mu is greater than equal to 0. Okay, so that's my that's my dual problem. <coughs> so this is the general technique for finding the dual of a primal problem. So this is my primal problem. I want to minimize C transpose X subject to some constraints. This is the dual problem which is to maximize minus B transpose mu subject to some constraints on mu. Okay? And this, this is the general way of finding the, a dual of a primal problem. And you will actually solve this. You will find a dual problem for a quadratic minimization problem in the assignment, assignment 5, which is uploaded by the way, I uploaded it in the morning today. So you can go and take a look at it. Okay, so that's one of your questions in this particular assignment. Okay, any question with this? Yeah. Right, right. In this case, it's not because both of them are linear program. But when we get to integer optimization problems, it's harder because we have two constraints, right? Yes, now we have two constraints. So why, why do you care about the dual program? The dual problem? Uh, okay, let me talk about it for a minute. Okay, I won't talk about it right now. Okay, <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it. We'll get to it probably in the next class. Okay, it becomes very clear why we should t talk about dual problem in, in case when you are solving very difficult optimization problems. Okay, because I mean in this case it's fairly simple linear optimization problem, so you don't really see the difference, but for complex problems you will see the difference. So we'll get to it in a, in a bit. Okay, the most important thing that you should remember is the following theorem or for fact where theorem let me write it as theorem q is concave d is convex so maximizing q of mu for mu in d mu greater than equal to 0 is a convex problem Okay, so even if you have, you start with a non-convex problem, the dual problem is a convex problem. Now proving this is not difficult, so I will skip it. Uh, it's not, I mean it is important, but it's just some mathematical jugglery. So, we'll skip the proof. And we'll talk about the next big result in this chapter, which is weak. <coughs> duality theorem, which says that Q, Q star is less than or equal to F star. Okay, where is F star? I haven't written what F star is. 
So Q star is this. The maximum value of Q of mu subject to these constraints. And F star is the optimal value of the function subject to the constraint GX less than or equal to zero. F star equals to minimum of FX GX less than or equal to zero. X in capital X. So the weak duality theorem says that Q star is always going to be a lower bound on F star. This theorem says this is a convex problem, so you can use gradient descent type algorithms to compute Q star. And if you solve, if you get Q star by solving this problem using gradient descent, you get a lower bound on F star. Okay. Why is this important? Okay, all of this will be done in the next class. Okay, this I hope this class was like a three hours long lecture so I could introduce everything one by one. Okay, so uh, so what did we do? We started with a primal problem. We constructed the dual problem. We studied the properties of the dual problem. And then we talked about weak duality theorem, which says that the optimal value to the dual problem is going to be less than or equal to the optimal value to the primal problem. And we say that if Q star is equal to F star, then there is no duality gap. And if Q star is strictly less than F star, then there is a duality gap. Okay, and let me go back to the picture. This is my F star, this is my mu star comma 1. So in this case, this is also going to be Q star. Okay, so Q star is equal to F star and there is no duality gap and let's see a picture of duality gap. This is my set S. This is my F star, this is my Q star, and this is my duality gap. This is my duality gap. Okay. So this is my Q star, this is the maximum value of Q that you can achieve so that S is in the positive half plane of this hyperplane. Okay, so that's the maximum Q star. And this is F star, so there is some gap between what Q star is and what F star is. And remember that in this problem there is no mu star, okay, there is no geometric multiplier. Whereas in this, in this problem, this mu star is actually the geometric multiplier for the problem. So this is the case with no duality gap because Q star is equal to F star. This is the case with duality gap and there is no geometric multiplier. Okay? So that is something that's part of this weak duality theorem. If there is no duality gap, then mu star exists and maximizes dual problem maximizes so if mu so in this case when there is no duality gap mu star exists and it maximizes the dual problem and if there is a duality gap then there is no mu star uh, 
So mu star does not exist. And that's evident from this picture, so proof by picture. Okay, so Q star is always less than or equal to F star. If Q star is equal to F star, then mu star exists. And it's actually the optimal solution to this convex problem. On the other hand, if there is a duality gap, then mu star does not exist, okay? But you still have this result. Q star is still less than, Q star is still less than F star, okay? So, I won't prove the weak duality theorem. The proof is fairly simple and given in the book. Uh, but what I'm going to do is tell you why this weak duality theorem is important. So this problem is important. Let's say you started with a problem uh, over discrete set, okay? So you can't really use any of the gradient descent techniques to solve the problem, okay? So what would you do? Well, you know this problem is defined over a continuous set, okay? So you can always use gradient descent because D is a convex, D is a convex subset of R R, okay? So D is a convex subset of R R. So you can always run gradient descent or any such algorithm to compute the optimal solution for the dual problem and then you can get a lower bound to the original problem. And you can use this idea in an iterative fashion, and that, that idea is known as branch and bound algorithm, so I'll introduce that branch and bound algorithm in the next class. So that uses this idea to try and come up with a solution asymptotically, which reduces the duality gap to zero, assuming that a solution exists to the original problem, okay? so. So remember everything when you come for the next class because I'm going to use all these ideas to introduce branch and bound algorithm, okay?